wish I had some people in here to say God is turning it around. For me, you got to make it personal. Say God is turning this thing around. For me. I may can't see it right now. I may can't feel it right now. But I believe God is turning it around for me. And you got to encourage yourself. You got to pat yourself on the back and tell yourself, I'm coming out of this because I serve a mighty God. Somebody say, I serve a mighty God. Hallelujah. Put those hands together and give God praise. Because he's worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, he is worthy to be praised. And I'm not going to let no enemy, I'm not going to let no devil try to take my praise. Hallelujah. The old church used to say, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. That's why people look at you and say, why are you still shout? Because this joy that I have, <laughs> the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. Put those hands together and give God praise one more time. He's been a mighty God. Oh, my God. I always like to say he's the heavyweight champion of the world. He's never lost a battle. Whoo, my, 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 my. And you know, we can always praise him because God is mighty. And then on top of that, he said, goodness and mercy. That's why David said, Yea, though I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I feel no evil because goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Oh, my, my, my. Now, we done took a minute to shout about what he has done. I want you to take the next few seconds to shout about what he's getting ready to do. Because what he's done has been great, but what he's getting ready to do is gonna be greater. Somebody ought to shout! Woo. Don't play with it. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't play with it. You've been through too much. He's done too much. He's opened up too many doors. He's healed your body too many times. He delivered you too many times for you to not shout about it. Oh, my God. I praise him. Woo. For what's about to happen. Hallelujah. You ought to praise him for what's about to happen. Come on, put it in the atmosphere and say, it's about to happen. What I need is about to happen. What I've been praying for is about to happen. What I believe God for is about to happen. The Bible said we can call those things as be not. To see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, it's about to happen. Ooh. Hallelujah. And like I said last week, sometimes you just got to 
dance on what you got left. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. Because God is getting ready. I don't know who I'm talking to in here, but I just believe God is getting ready to turn some situations, some circumstances around for you. Hallelujah. Oh, my. Ghost in here. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Point, point to somebody and say, He's going to do it for you. Oh, my. I just give Him glory. I give Him honor. I give Him praise. Because he's never let me down. I've been let down by people. I've been let down in situations. But God has never let me down. He's faithful. If you ain't got nothing else to praise him for, you can praise him because you know he's faithful. He's kept my wife, he's kept my marriage, he's kept my home, he's kept my children, he's kept my grandchildren, he's kept my great-grandchildren. God is faithful. Is well. Hallelujah. Is well. You got to let it be well with your soul. My soul. Lift your hands and say, Lord, it's well with my soul. some trust in chariots but I will trust in the name of the Lord the scripture says because the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous that's us shall run therein and be safe glory to God you got to trust him when you can't trace him you got to trust him when you can't see him you got to know that he's the one Amen. Working behind the scenes. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Glory to God. But there's a sweet, powerful presence in this house. Glory to God. And for those that are watching us, we... Whew, we know that you sense it too. So right in your home, you, you ought to lift your hands and just tell him thank you. Oh, yes. He's doing something right now for somebody. Glory to God. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And all that's within me, bless his holy name. Thank you, Jesus. In my brokenness, I'm going to give him glory. Because the scripture says he'll give you beauty for your ashes. Yes, I am. He did us, yes. Somebody ought to give him glory. And, and I just believe he's setting us up to exit this year better than we came in it. Glory to God. We've been through some stuff this year. Some stuff we never thought we'd ever experience. 
but he's already cleaning it up. I said he's already cleaning it up. And he's getting ready to allow us to leave this year better than we came in it. And amen. I believe that next year is going to be an awesome year. I'm going to believe that. Glory to God. There was a time when I didn't think I would be able to, amen, see, but I thank God I can see. Glory to God. There was a time when I was, amen, was, was, was just laying in the bed after operation wondering, am I going to be able to walk like I used to walk? But I'm walking. <laughs> Glory to God. Matter of fact, I'm running. Hallelujah. And I'm riding and doing all those things that the enemy said you would never see that again. But how many know the devil is a liar? need a few bold folk in here just to say it. The devil is a liar. Whatever you told me you were going to try to take, <laughs> I'm going to tell you to your face, you a liar. Woo! I need a few bold folk in here saying, the devil, you ain't going to take my body. All sickness, you ain't going to take my body. The devil is a liar. Know that bishop because the scripture said he was wounded for our transgression he was bruised for our iniquities but the and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his strike do i have any people right now feel your healing on the way with his stripes i'm gonna give him a pre-praise for my pre-healing with his strike Take your seats and tell somebody, say, it's a done deal. <laughs> You've been hanging in there. You've been hanging on this long. This is a done deal. 
But if the enemy would have had it right away, you would have been gone a long time ago. But tell somebody, say, it's a done deal. <laughs> Next time somebody asks you, all right, just tell Next time somebody asks you, are oh, you all right? Tell them, say, I'm yet holding on, baby. It's a done deal. Uh, I'm trying to slow down here, but this is. <sighs> Hallelujah. We thank God for the presence of the Lord that's in the house today. He's such an awesome and wonderful God. I mean, it's so explosive in here. Hey, 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 hey! Ooh. Ah, God. Every time I think, every time I think it's not gonna get better, it gets better. I mean, God is still blessing his people in spite of what we're going through. Hallelujah. Uh, mm -hmm. He's still blessing in spite of what we're going through. Hallelujah. We want to welcome everyone here that's in person. We thank God for you, all of our friends and guests. Certainly all of the members of this marvelous church, we thank God for you. And those that are listening to us online, we thank God for you. Just come to worship with us this day at the Mount Calvary Holy Church Family Worship Center. Amen. In the great city of Concord, North Carolina, where we simply believe, amen, about impacting lives for the kingdom. I, I honor my lovely and gorgeous wife, my friend. Amen. My partner in ministry and in life, co-pastor Mickens, mighty, mighty woman of God. I praise God for her. Amen. The queen of this ministry to all of those that are here in this house. We praise God for you. All of the officials of this ministry, we thank God for you. And uh, we certainly always thank God for this wonderful praise team uh, that God has blessed us with. And such a wonderful minister of music. We thank God for Elvin Mickens Jr. Amen. He, such a blessing. Amen. It's, it, listen, I'm telling you, when you have anointed music and anointed singing, it makes a difference. And I praise God. Amen. For all of the ministers of this ministry today. Amen. Quickly, let's go and prepare our hearts for what God wants to say today. We do have some great teaching, I believe God wants to release in this house and as well as online today. So right where you are, help me to fill this place with an aroma of prayer. Let's begin just to give him some glory. Father, we thank you. We bless you. You're such an awesome and wonderful and dynamic Father. You are our source. You are our foundation. And we thank you, God, because in you we live, in you we move, and in you we have our being. And we say thank you today. We thank you for the courts of praise and worship. Because of that, God, our hearts is free in your spirit. Now, God, God, bring our attention to your word where you speak to your people by the wayside. Grow us, direct us, lead us, empower us, strengthen us, and we'll give you the glory, we'll give you the honor, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Let everybody say praise him. Amen. As we uh, are, we are preparing to conclude this year, when I'm saying that we do have a few more months left in it, uh, God has been leading us for those that are here for the first time and hearing it for the first time online. God has been leading us amen, to empower the church, to let the church that this is the year of the, let them know that this is our year, the year of the church. And within every quarter of this year, God has been just blessing us and giving us particular focal points. And as we, amen, entered into this fourth quarter, our focal point is, amen, um, directed to uh, kingdom legacy and, and uh, to pass it on. That's what God wants us to do <coughs> within this fourth quarter to talk about kingdom legacy. Pass it on. Amen. So our foundation word again is 
legacy. And uh, legacy uh, is defined at best as uh, anything handed down or passed down from ancestors to predecessors, from generation to generation. Uh, God wants us to know that when we talk about a man legacy, which a lot of times we don't talk about it in the church as I think we should, because it's a powerful word uh, that where it comes from the mind of God, and uh, uh, and I think if the church can grasp this teaching on legacy, we will be better in the future. A person by the name of uh, Victor Belfort. He said, uh, legacy is not what I did for myself, it's what I'm doing for the next generation. And so this has allowed me and pushed me into the mindset that we must begin to, to do things, we must begin to do things, amen, not for ourselves, but for the next generation. But when you hear the word legacy, it is powerful in itself. But when we add the word kingdom, uh, it, it evolves into a different dimension. I think uh, it is a dimension of the church when we say kingdom legacy. And I think that we have to really revisit this and uh, evaluate this closely uh, as people of God, as we continue to move through the 21st century. You see, uh, uh, kingdom legacy is really about the light of God or God's light and God's will to the world. And that's why, amen, the Bible lets us know uh, that uh, light and legacy uh, is really something that we should pass down to every generation on this earth. Uh, from the fall of mankind to this very day, uh, I believe God wants us to pass on his life-changing stuff or life-changing word or light to a world that is dying every day. So many times, amen, we hear that, that the world is dying every day, and we see it and we take it for granted. But this world is dying every day. People are leaving this world every day. But we are somewhat, amen, if not of a surety, amen, uh, by the will of God, we are called to uh, share the light, the light of legacy. As a matter of fact, of what God has done. The psalmist says in Psalm 145 and 4, he said, let each generation tell its children of, uh, of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. So this, this is something God wants us to do that we must begin to tell our children and uh, uh, tell them not only that God is good, but we ought to tell them of the mighty acts. We ought to tell them of the power of God. These are the things that we need to pass down and tell them what the church is supposed to be, how the church is supposed to look. Uh, that's why when I think about kingdom legacy, uh, I, I have come to the conclusion that kingdom legacy is kingdom discipleship. And kingdom discipleship is kingdom legacy. As a matter of fact, I don't think you can even separate the two. Because the two work together. When you talk about kingdom legacy, you have to talk about kingdom discipleship. Why? Because kingdom legacy is really uh, the light that shines in the darkness. Oftentimes, we always share the scripture that he's brought us out of darkness into the marvelous light. And I believe that God sent his kingdom legacy through Jesus Christ. Uh, amen. Uh, but, but the world and the culture and even the church has resisted. Uh, we have resisted, whether it is intentional or unintentional, we have pushed back, amen, the passing on of Jesus Christ from generation to generation. 
So we don't talk Jesus Christ to our children. We don't talk Jesus Christ to our friends. We don't talk Jesus Christ like we used to in the days of old. Because we have come to the place, amen, that I believe, amen, uh, as John said, that Jesus is among us, but we have not behold his glory. John said that he, he was the light to the world, amen, but, but, but the world did not behold who he was. Uh, as a matter of fact, he, the Bible says he came to his own, and his own didn't even receive him like they should. And so uh, that gives to let us know that we're yet living in this time that there is pushback, because when you talk about Jesus, people get tight. Uh, people change the conversation. Now, you can talk about prosperity. Mm -hmm. You can talk about making money. You can talk about living a certain way and a certain lifestyle. But when you mention Jesus, when you talk about Jesus, when you ask people, where is your life in regards to the will of God, you get pushed back. People don't want to talk about that. They, they, they don't want to talk about that because, see, the greatest legacy uh, is not the importance of going to church. But the greatest legacy is to help to advance the kingdom of God through Christian discipleship. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a message, a amen, that we don't shout about a lot. Glory to God. But it's a message that is necessary for us to become what God wants us to become. Uh, with this in mind, that brings us to our lesson text today that's found in Luke. Luke uh, 5, starting at verse number 1. And this, I want to read this to you in the uh, New uh, Living Translation. And, uh, and when I read this, it, it was a powerful text, and I've read it before. But uh, it really began to speak to my spirit, and I believe it's going to speak to somebody today it, uh, in regards to God's people, in regards to the church. Uh, I want to ask a question to the church here. Is the church here? <laughs> Maybe you don't know who you are. Is the church here? <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let's look at what the Bible says. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at uh, the water's edge. Uh, for the fishermen had left them and was washing their nets. Setting in, uh, stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, uh, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Uh, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper. And let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, <laughs> I'll let the net down again. We're going to deal with this. And, 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 and this time their net was so full of fish they began to tear. A shout for help uh, brought their partners uh, in the other boat. And soon, both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized uh, what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was all struck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the son of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishers for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. So for the next few minutes, we're going to continue this 
quarterly teaching of the importance of discipleship legacy. Discipleship legacy. When you think about discipleship legacy, it's all about knowing Christ, growing in Christ, serving Christ, and sharing Christ God's way. Now, b- before we get into the lesson text, uh, I-, I want to make note here that in this text, it is the first perception of the instituting of the concept of discipleship, which is an initial call to all followers of Jesus Christ. This is where it happens. This is where it was birthed. And so, amen, with this in mind, I want to I open up with a contrasting statement that as God's people, we have kind of, we kind of operate opposite in the church. First of all, we're called to be Christians. We're called to be Christ-like. We're called to act like Christ. We're called to walk and to live in sainthood and in holiness. And we're called to be disciples. Then later, we are called to be preachers, and in some cases, apostles, in some cases, prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers, and administrators uh, and of gifts in the church. That's the order for which God has set in the church. But ironically, today, we operate opposite of the order that I just stated. Ironically, amen, we have desensitized and diminished the Bible teaching on Christianity, on being Christ-like, on walking and living in holiness or sainthood. Ironically, we have diminished and we have desensitized talking about becoming disciples to a sin-filled world. We are operating now opposite of the way God set up his people to become an impact to the world. We, we're now, a man. we have now exploited and we have distorted the callings of the five-fold ministry. And, and we have distorted, a man. the administrative gifts and callings in the church. Because now today, when you look around, everybody wants to be an apostle. I know y'all getting quiet on me in here. Everybody want to be a bishop. Everybody want to be, amen, a prophet. Everybody, amen, wants to be a preacher. Everybody wants to be a teacher. When you have to look what the scripture says, the Bible says in Ephesians that he gave some. Y'all getting quiet. Hallelujah. He gave some. Apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the perfecting of the saints. He gave some. That indicates to me that everybody is not a prophet. Everybody is not an apostle. Everybody is not an evangelist. Everybody is not a pastor. Everybody is not a teacher. Because when Jesus released gifts in the church, the Bible said one word that defied it and clarified, he gave some. But we're operating opposite of the order of God, and we got apostles everywhere, we got prophets everywhere, we got evangelists everywhere, and we don't understand we got pastors everywhere when these gifts are offices. In other words, everybody is not called to that level of being an administ- a top administrator in the body of Christ just because you can preach doesn't mean that you can pastor because there's a difference in pastoring and preaching. Oh, y'all getting quiet on me in here. 
Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's all right. We're going to make the enemy real mad today. Hallelujah. Because everybody wants a title and don't want what God has originally called them to be. Some people are, pa- some people are pastors and some are administrators. The Bible says that you got to abide in your calling. In other words, find your place, sit down in it, and operate in it, and stop trying to be like somebody else when God didn't call you to be that. <laughs> and then he goes, he goes further in the scriptures. Paul goes further in the scripture and says, all of, he says, all of you together are Christ's body. And each of you, watch this, is a part of it. He says, here are some of the parts of God that God has appointed to the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then those that, who do miracles. Then those who, uh, who have gifts of healing. Then those who, have, who can help others, then those who have gifts of leadership, then those who speak in unknown languages, then those, then he comes back and says, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power of, to do miracles? Do we all have the gifts of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown tongues? Do we all have the ability to interpret uh, uh, unknown languages? Uh, uh, he says, of course not. Because everybody don't have it. I've heard people say, I, I, listen, I operate in it all. No, you don't operate in it all. The only person that operated in it all was Jesus Christ. But the Bible said that we should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We got this thing backwards. We're pushing all these gifts and forgot about what God wants us to be, and that is to be Christ-like. We, we're pushing all these titles and forgot, what, forgot about what God told us to be, that we ought to be, amen, we ought to live holy. We ought to be disciples of Jesus Christ. We want to be a title. We want to hold a title, but what, how we live does not measure up to the title. So the Bible says, in 1 Corinthians 12, it says uh, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit. The same spirit is the source of it all. He said the, there, are different, uh, there are different kinds of services, but we, uh, but we serve the same Lord. He said God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in us. What he's saying here is that if we do what we're called to do, we're serving the same God. There should be no competition and there should be no people trying to compete against who can do better, who can preach better, who can preach longer. It's not how long you preach. It's what God told you to preach. But we're operating in the opposite. Because we're pushing all this and forget about the first mandate is to become a Christian, is to live like Christ, is to become a disciple because that's the ground floor of where the disciples started. Later they became apostles, but first they had to become disciples. You, oh my God, help me in here. You cannot, amen, move above the first level first. Get the first level, amen, completed and brought into perspective before you can go to the next level. Don't tell me God called you the pastor and you don't know how to handle his people. You don't speak to nobody. You walk like you're the high and mighty. No, baby, you got to learn what God wants you to be. He wants you to be disciples. Hmm. 
disciples. Disciples. In the Greek means matis. It is a root word meaning pupil. Come on, be a pupil. Sit down and get taught. Taught how to live for Christ. Taught how to live right. Taught how to handle perspective. Taught how to handle trouble in life. Taught how to deal with the ways of life. Taught how to stand in Christ. Taught how to handle the pressure. How, how, hey, let me tell you, let me tell you, how, how you going to crack and you got Jesus? How you going to crack and you got the Holy Ghost? Because the Holy Ghost teaches you how to handle pressure. Sometimes the Holy Ghost will tell you to just sit down, be still, and I, I got this thing. I'm taking care of this thing. But you got to see what God is saying here. We got to become apprentice. We've got to become people that practice what we learn. So as I conclude this message, I want to talk from this text two perspectives. And the first is to be discipled. To be poured into. The second is to be discipling. To pour into others. In this text, this comes alive. The first part of it is a powerful part of it. This, by the scholars of the text, said this is the Galilean ministry of Jesus Christ. They call it the Galilean. He started here. And he spent three years in this place called Galilee. And I asked the Lord, why did you, why did you start in Galilee? He said, you got to see what Galilee is all about. Galilee is a direct picture of where you are. I said, really? <sighs> Galilee was a place that was beautiful. It had hot springs. It had, it had marvelous uh, architectural buildings. It was governed by man-made traditions and philosophies. In other words, everybody had a right to speak as to who they were, as to what they think. He said it was a per it's a perfect, perfect replica of the times you live in. We've got beautiful cities. We've got beautiful sceneries. And we're living in a day that everybody has a right to speak what they think they believe. Except the church. The church is the only entity that has become silent in a time that we should be speaking because if everybody got a right to express what they believe, why don't we have one? And here Jesus begins his ministry in this place called Galilee because it's a little more to Galilee than what you see. Hmm. Even though Galilee was beautiful and had all these wonderful architectural buildings and it was driven by the Roman Empire, uh, the, 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 the translation of the word uh, 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 Galilee means whirlwind. It means cycle. It means to go around in a circle and don't get any results. I, I thought about this, and God began to reveal this to me. He said, he said Let's look at the time that you're living in. We're living in a time that it seems like it's a whirlwind. It, it, things are moving fast. People are going around in cycles, but never achieving, God help me, what they're really called to do. So you can look good on the outside, but in the inside, you can be circling around and ending up in the same place. And you need to ask yourself a question. If you're in the same place in your mind, in your spirit, in your soul, you were last year, I think you got to look at your Galilean situation and let Jesus come in. Jesus stayed there for three years because there was a need. And the reason why God is...
is, is pushing me. And the reason why God won't let it go, won't, he, he, he won't allow me to let go about teaching this, a discipleship because we're in a situation where people need something. Oh, God. We're in a place where people want to hear a word, not only preached from the pulpit, but preached from the mouths of God's people. We need a word. The people need a word that's going to give them life and hope and give them a future. We're living in a time where people are sick and tired of going around in the same circle, ending up in the same place. That's why we have to be discipled. Because the truth be told, we are just like the world. Inside. We're going around in the same circle. We have been programmed to do the same thing, but we don't get the reward. We don't get the results. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We come to church week after week, but there ain't no change. It sounds like a cycle. We come to church week after week. There's no miracles. There's no signs. There's no wonders. There's no change because we are in a Galilean situation, not only externally, but internally. So, so Jesus begins to start his discipling. He comes into this place. He walks over to a man. Uh, he, the people are pressing him. They, they, they are pressing. They, they are all over Jesus because they want a word. Now, now here's where you know you're in the right place at the right time. When you can feel people wanting something. They, they, they want it. Your family really wants it. But they too proud to say something. You go to family reunion, you don't say nothing about the Lord. Or you won't talk about who cooking Did grandma bring them, them greens? Hallelujah. I got to have them greens. You don't, you don't sit down. Now, 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 now our, our relatives, they having a, they having a ball. They, they want to party and they want to do all that. But, but when you come, you don't even talk about Jesus when you don't realize the power that God has already put in you because when you come, it freezes the environment. You stop the party. Then they begin to move away from you because they don't want to be exposed to what you have because they know if they sit among you long enough, sooner or later, you're going to share some of what you got and going to be able to change their lives. So you don't even realize how powerful you are. Jesus comes into this situation and he looks at it. He, he, he explores, he exposes what, what ministry really is. He was pressed by the people and then he gets in a boat. He goes to find a boat. Amen. He goes he looks around and he finds two boats there and he he gets into the boat and go out into the water and share with the people as i began to read this god said look at where jesus is ministering he's ministering on water <laughs> things that are shaky and shifty and moving. Here's your best time to minister. Not when you're in this church, but when you're in places that are shifty and moving and unstable. And we're in a society that's unstable and it's shifty and moving. And God wants us to look at our ministry now. Are we in the right place because of the needs of the people? Jesus gets into the boat. But amen. But let me digress. <laughs> because when it comes to discipling, you got to see what, ha what happens here. He was pressed by the people. He looks around and he sees two boats. He, ent he steps in, the scripture says, to one boat. But look at what he calls the boat. He calls the boat empty. 
he sees two empty boats. He chooses one of the boats to get into. If we're going to become disciples, first of all, we got to realize there's some stuff that we got to empty out. We got to become empty enough to allow Jesus to step into our boat. You, you didn't catch that right there. Y'all didn't catch that. We, we're so full of stuff that's unnecessary that we have not allowed Jesus to allow us to come into our lives so he can disciple us because these boats were designed to catch fish. Jesus said, I want to step into some things that's designed to do some things for me. He said, I need a vessel that is designed to catch fish. This, you got to see the parallel in here. You got to see what God is trying to say. We got a lot of people come to church to get filled with a word, but we're not allowing God to let that word deal with the emptiness of our hearts. So we'll leave here full of the word, but we won't let it deal with the emptiness in our spirit. Therefore, we cannot become a man, a vessel that is used by God because you got to understand you and I, everybody in here is created with something to do, created with a purpose, created to touch somebody's life, but you can't, God said, you can't get to that place until you empty some things out of you. He gets into the boat. And then, and the reason why, because they were on the other side taking care of the nets. And they were there cleaning nets, and then Peter comes over. It's Simon Peter. See, Simon Peter was the first one that he had to deal with about discipleship. He says to Simon Peter, he says, push me out there. <laughs> just, just push me out there. So Simon pushes Jesus out into the water. Simon had to realize that I got to give Jesus permission to do what I need him to do. And so Simon Peter pushes him out and he speaks and then he comes back and he begins to pour into them. First he pours into the people. Then he disciples the disciples. He comes back after he finished. He sits down with them for a second. He tells Simon Peter, he says, get in the boat and launch out into the deep. In other words, go into places that you haven't gone before. If you're going to be discipled by Jesus, you got to go into places you've never been before. In other words, what I'm saying is we got to get past this church rhythmic where we're used to coming to church every Sunday but not touching the lives of people. That takes launching out into the deep. He said, if you launch out into the deep, then I'm going to show you what you can catch. But what we do is what Peter did before he launched them out, before he pushed them, before he, before he went out. He said, Lord, listen, I've been toiling with this thing all night long. In other words, what Jesus was saying, you, what, what Peter was saying, Simon was saying, you can't tell me how to fish. I'm an expert. I, I know how to do this. What Jesus was saying, I need you to go out into the leap, to the deep, to some places you've never been. So what Simon was saying, watch this, I know how to have church. But Jesus says, go out deeper. You say, I've been toiling here in this church, ain't nothing happening. But Jesus says, go out in the deep. You say, I'm an expert of having church. But ain't nobody coming to church because I'm an expert of how to do it. Y'all know we know how to do it. If Mickey hit them keys right about now, everybody in here will go to shouting because we're experts in having church. When Jesus is saying, you got to go out to the deep, go out to the places you are not comfortable with and you've never been before. He said, he said let me pour into you what it takes to be a disciple. 
go out into the places you ain't never been before. Forget about your expertise. Hallelujah. Because your expertise has made you so proud that God can't use you. When God is saying, I want to use your expertise to be able to do what I called you to do. Some of us in here are so caught up in our expertise, but God can't use us. God can't, amen, work and touch people's lives because we got the idea of how all supposed to work. Get ready to close this out. When you do something that you ain't never done before, it's scary. And, and that's why I got to teach this. We came here, we never built a church before. But God said, launch out. We, 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 did, we, did, we didn't know all God was telling. He said, go into the deep. We did it. God took over. Because the minute that Peter said, if you say so. See, you got to get to the point that even though you don't understand it, if God tells you something, if you say so. What he was saying, got to put down my expertise now because I've been, listen, I've been fishing for a long time. Peter said, I am an expert. I learned from the experts. And, and how are you going to come and tell me how to fish? But he had to realize who he was talking to. He says, if, if, if you say so. Because now it gets ready to shift from being disciple to being discipling. Because the minute that he, he admitted that, the Bible said that when he pushed the net out, watch this, when he pushed the net out, the net was so full of fish that the net began to tear. Please walk with me here. Amen. That, he, that the boat was beginning to sink. When you become disciples and learn how to disciple, God said, I'll bless you in a way that you will, your boat will be so full of stuff that, you, that you're going to need to share it with somebody else. The reason why we're not blessed like we should is because we don't share what God tells us to share and that's why our boats are not full. We are struggling every day. Come to church, get fed off the word, but we're struggling every day because we don't cast our net in the right places. We want to we want to cast it into popularity. We want to be popular. But deal with people that don't look with you. Deal with people that don't act like you. Deal with people that don't smell like you. Deal, help people, amen, that's less fortunate than you. When you, amen, put your net out like that, God said, I will cause you to be so blessed. You'll be like Peter and the rest of them. They couldn't even get the fish in there. It was so much that the fish, that the boat began to sink, and they had to call, amen, the others and say, come take some of this fish because we got so much. Let me tell you, God said, when we as his people, amen, learn how to do disciple others he said I'll bless your house I'll bless your church I'll bless your ministry when we do what God tells us to do he said we'll have so much that we got to share it with everybody else you work 40 hours a week but you still don't have enough you do what God tell you to do God said I'll bless you beyond your imagination we're working hard on the wrong side when God said what we got to do is we got to do what he says so in my closing, and right now I'm closing this up because y'all getting tired. The Bible said they had so much that they had to call each other over. And they still had over and abundant. I firmly believe that as we conclude this year, as we continue to teach on this discipleship, that God said he's going to cause us to see an abundance. Amen. Beyond our shallow. You can stand. You can stand. You can stand.
I'm going to keep on pulling on the hearts of God's people. I'm going to keep on pulling on you because are you empty enough to let him step in? Are you understanding that you are a vessel created? And at the end of the day when Jesus saw them with all the fish, he says, don't be afraid because then they realized who he was. He said, don't be afraid. He said, I'm going to make you fishes of men. That's what God calls us to do. He called us as disciples to be fishers of men. But we cannot be that until we get discipled. Everybody needs somebody to pour into them. I don't care how much knowledge you have. I don't care how much learning you have. I don't care how much, I don't care how much education you have. Everybody needs somebody to pour into them. And then God said, I need you to become discipling. That you be able to pour into somebody else. Some people in the church will sit here and hear this message and say, I know that scripture. I know, I know what the scripture says. That's saying to me, you don't want what God want to pour into you. But today he come to pour in some things so that you can become the disciple God wants you to be. So that you can begin to infect and touch people in a way never, that, like, that, like they've never been touched before. So my challenge to you today, as we leave this place, look at what's around you. Look at the people. Look at the people you come in contact with. And then start discipling. Just You don't have to share a whole sermon. You don't, you don't have to share a whole scripture. You can just love on them. You can just care for them. You can let them know that you're there for them. You can let them, you can let them know, amen, if they need somebody to talk to. And slowly but surely, you are bringing people in. People come to our church based on how you relate to them. God said we got to change the culture of the church because people are looking for something. How many in here enjoy this message? How many say that I find myself in this word and now I want to empty myself so Jesus can step into my into those areas of my life. If I'm speaking to you, lift your hands as an acknowledgement that this is what you need him to do. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how you have ministered this word, how you taught this word, how you shared this word with us. We thank you right now because, but God, in the midst of it, the most important thing, Jesus couldn't even preach until he found the empty boat. He couldn't even, amen, pour into his disciples until he found this empty boat. We're standing here now with empty hearts. There are some places in us that are empty. We need to be filled with your presence. We need you right now to go into the corners of our spirit. We need you right now to deal with the hardness of our heart. We need you to deal with the hardness of our mind. We need you to change our way of looking at people and realizing, amen, that people People do things not because they want to do it but because they're driven to do it and there's a need for them to change so God today speak to the hearts of your people give them humility give them humbleness give them God a passion and a compassion for your people prepare us as your boat Take us into unconquered territories. Launch us out into the deep, into the places we are not comfortable with, to the people we don't normally talk to, to the people we don't normally reach out to. God, this week I pray that we will, God, stop by, amen, and just talk to somebody. We may meet them in the store. We may meet them in the restaurant. But God, give us a moment to pour into somebody because we've been poured in today. We thank you, and we give you glory. Right here is a moment of repentance. If you will, in your own way, if you think and you, amen, know you need to ask God to forgive you for the shortcomings, just take this moment and ask him to forgive you. Ask him right now. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor, and we give you praise. And thank you such an awesome and wonderful God. And we just love you.
because you are awesome. It may be somebody in this room today that you may not know Jesus. You may not know him, but you want to know him. And you want to come back to him. You may have strayed away. And you said, you know, I need to get myself together. If I'm speaking to you today, be bold enough to lift your hands and say, here, here I am. I need Jesus and I need to come back to him. Amen. You that may be listening, you may want to do it that's listening. Amen. Online. If God is speaking to you and this is your moment, just pray with us for a second. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this moment of reaching out to those that realize that they need you. We thank you for those God realize that they've fallen short of you. So God, today, help us to lead them in prayer. So right now, if you've fallen away or you know you need Jesus, first of all, you ought to say, Jesus, I need you to come into my life. I need you to forgive me of my sins. I need you to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Because I confess with my mouth and I believe it in my heart that you died for me. You rose for me on the third day. And because you have done this, I want you to come into my life right now as my Lord and my Savior. And if you know the Lord has done this, you ought to say right now, I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that Jesus that I'm saved and Jesus is my Lord. And even now, if you strayed away from the church and you want to come back to the church, you ought to pray this prayer and say, Lord, come back into my life. I know I've fallen short. I've let you down, but I need to, amen, come back and be your disciple and be the one to be like, be like you. So as you come, God, I pray that you would empower me with the Holy Ghost. And allow me to be what you call me to be in the last and evil days. And we'll give you glory, we'll give you honor, and we'll give you praise. In Jesus' name, let everybody say praise him. Amen. Come on and give God praise right now. Amen. If this word is blessed you, we're going to continue our worship in giving today. And we give by way of tithes and offering. We thank everyone in this ministry as well as friends and guests. Amen. I believe that if you bless the house that bless you, God will continue to bless your family. Amen. And we, we make the word of God true. He says, bring it to the storehouse tithes and offering that there might be meat in the house. Amen. He said, if you do that, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pull you out of blessing. You won't have room to receive. Hallelujah. And he said, I will rebuke the hand of the vow. Everybody stand with your tithes and offerings. And when you lift it to heaven, and let's just wave it to let God know that we believe you're opening the door for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we give, you give back to us good measures, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Thank you for those that give online, those, God, that give by Givelify Cash App. We thank you for those that give in person. And as they give, continue to lift your curse off of our life. And we'll give you glory, honor, and praise. You may give at this time. Glory to God. Sunday. We hope to see you next Sunday, same time and same place. In Jesus' name, God bless you.